This past week, those who have been playing with embedded computers and micro devices have had some fantastic news in the release of the Raspberry Pi 3, the latest in a series of microcomputers, low-cost computers from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So I thought maybe it might be a good time to bring out the man himself, Mr. Eben Upton. He is the founder and the former trustee of the Raspberry Pi Foundation, now the CEO of Raspberry Pi. Eben, thank you very much for joining us. Great to be here. Now, for the folks who, who may not know a lot about your backstory, you are a consummate geek. You are a man of electronics, <laughs> born and bred through and through. You have a BA in physics and engineering from the University of Cambridge. You have a diploma in computer science from Cambridge as well, and then a PhD from the computer laboratory over at the University of Cambridge. So you, you really live this. this. This wasn't just something that you did on a whim. This was something that you've been studying and dreaming about for decades, really. Yeah, so this is this is I think goes all the way back to um, uh, all the way back at least to the age of eight when I first got my hands on a on a computer I could program, uh, which I actually have one of here on my desk, not the one that I had when I was a kid, but the same model I have here on my desk. Uh, but yeah, this is so this is I'm 37 now, so this is this is 29 years in the making. Uh, what a, what some people may not realize about the Raspberry Pi is I think it actually has roots in your time working with a, a, a program at Cambridge that introduced young college students into the world of computer science. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? That's right. So um, when I was finishing my doctorate about 10 years ago, um, I had a, I, um, everybody at Cambridge, all students at Cambridge are associated with a college. We have about 30 colleges and the university is kind of a federation of these colleges. Um, and there's a role, there's a college level role called director of studies. And the role of the director of studies is to uh, organize the undergraduate teaching uh, for a subject and also to interview high school students who might want to come and study that subject. Um, and yeah, we used to go out and uh, talk to school kids about computer science and about why they should consider studying it. Um, but we were really struggling at the time. We'd seen a, we'd kind of seen a collapse from maybe the late 90s to, uh, to 2005, 2006. We saw a very um, precipitous decline. Uh, in the number of people who were interested, and also in the kinds of things that those students, the students we did admit, very bright kids, but the kind of things that they knew when they came in the door, the kind of things we could assume that they knew on day one. Right, right. And so a, a lot of this, a, a lot of your academic experience has been trying to bring what has been before sort of a black art to people who may or may not have an inclination to pursue it. Uh, I, I think that's, that's actually a really nice way to describe the Raspberry Pi because mm -hmm. we've seen since the first one, how it has really sparked a revolution. There are people who are building a computer who never would have thought about doing that. And there are people who have built computers who have found these little $35 machines to be absolutely fantastic because they can put them everywhere. Tell me about the growing pains of the Raspberry Pi 1, because we actually do have a history. You were on the Twit TV network on one of our shows called Triangulation with Leo Laporte, mm -hmm. and uh, you were talking about how uh, Raspberry Pi was going to be a DEF CON, and I was so excited to meet you at DEF CON. Uh, we, we were going to do an interview. I was going <laughs> to grab a couple of, of boards myself, and then you weren't able to make it. And that was that was actually the story of the conference, because everyone wanted yeah. a Raspberry and you couldn't show up. Yeah, so this was this was the summer of 2012. Um, the I mean, Raspberry Pi's growing pains were, were many and various, but the um, probably the one that most people experienced was through 2012. We were completely unable um, to. We launched um, exactly four years ago, so we launched on the 29th of February, and really for the first nine months, we were completely unable to keep up with the level of demand for the device. Um, and we had hoped to attend DEF CON. Uh, we had we booked a table at DEF CON. Uh, we traveled to Vegas, my wife and I traveled to Vegas, um, uh, in the expectation that we would have some hundreds of Raspberry Pis that we could sell to people. And we discovered uh, when we arrived uh, from the UK that we had a couple of problems, the first of which was that we had no Raspberry Pis, and the second of which was that even had we had Raspberry Pis, we had no um, credible way of paying Nevada sales tax. Um, so we actually, even if we had pies, we would have had no way to sell them to people. And so we had to, we paid for our table and we forfeited our table, um, which was kind of sad. 
really. Um, uh, and particularly because that community, that you know, the kind of DEF CON community is really the, that was the original core uh, Raspberry Pi community, kind of geeks and hackers and makers and people who already know about computers um, and, and, and wanted to build something. I mean, since then, we've we, we've kind of grown out into the educational space that we were that we were targeting, but certainly in the summer of 2012, um, that was really kind of our wheelhouse. I actually find that to be a, a perfect starting point for the story that is Raspberry Pi because you were caught a little bit unaware when when it first came out. I I, I don't know if you you realize how popular it was going to be as quickly as it became popular. But then you could look at the Raspberry One, and you can look at the B, and then you can look at the Raspberry Two. And now the Raspberry Pi 3, and there's a little ecosystem that has grown up around the Raspberry Pi. Makers and builders love these devices, mm. and you have given us so much with this. Let's talk a little bit about the Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, two stories here. First, there's the tech. We're going to talk about the hardware, but also the fact that you've, you've grown up so much as a company that these mm. are available. They're, they're, if you yeah. want one, you can buy one on the day that it was announced, yeah. which was fantastic. Yeah. What went into making the three, because it's not just a faster system on a chip, you've you've integrated more devices into the board. Yeah, so, um, I mean, the big the big kind of headlines with three are, are it's about 50% faster than the Raspberry Pi 2, it's got 64-bit capability, which kind of gives us some room for growth in the next year or two. Um, and we've been able to integrate Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and probably in terms of engineering effort here at Raspberry Pi, um, uh, it's the wireless that's been the biggest challenge. You know, this is um, at the point we at the point we um, launched Raspberry Pi One, we had no employees. Uh, at the point we launched Raspberry Pi Two, well, we we'd recently acquired some employees, but until very shortly before Raspberry Pi Two, we only had three or four employees, three technical employees in the organization. Um, we now have something like between ten and. 20, depending on how you count contractors. Um, and what that allowed us to do, what we couldn't do before, was all of both the design work and then the compliance work associated with wireless. Um, wireless compliance is hard. Um, global wireless compliance is very, very hard. Um, we, we wanted to be able to launch Raspberry Pi 3. Um, it's our first product with a radio in. And we wanted to be able to launch it in pretty much every country of the world on day one. Um, and you know, we're, we're very fortunate that uh, some of the people who've joined us over the last couple of years are the people, uh, particularly Roger Thornton, who ran our, uh, ran our conformance campaign, uh, are the people we need in order to do that. Um, yeah. uh, Evan, you are somewhat of the Nintendo of the, uh, the embedded systems world because <laughs> The software I wrote for my Raspberry can, One will can we, work. Can we not? Can we not? Can we not be the Neo Geo? Can oh we, no, no, not the Neo Geo. No, definitely not the Neo Geo. But <laughs> we are definitely not the Neo Geo. In, in the sense that any any of the projects that I've written before will work on the three, and even the GPIO yeah. header is the same as the Raspberry Two, which I love. That I love the fact that you're continuing yeah. support for all of these different things, from the screen to uh, the shields that we've come mm -hmm. to know and love. Oh, please tell me, where do you want this to go? So. Of course, Raspberry will continue. We will get more and more devices. These $35 computers will become more and more ubiquitous. Where would you like to see Raspberry Pi next year? Um, I think we'd, I think, well, I think you can break it down into two sides. You can break it down into, we're, an, we're a charity, we're a not-for-profit. And so if you look at the not-for-profit, the educational side, um, what I hope is that we're able to bring We've had a, quite a lot of success now in the UK in um, uh, teaching people to program, in establishing awareness uh, that um, the, the lack of programming skills uh, is a problem, um, and in producing um, materials and teacher training that can be uh, that, that can be used to uh, you know to do something about this problem. My hope for the for the charity for the foundation over the over the next year is that we can start to bring some of that to other countries, in particular uh, to North America. Um, North America is our largest market for Raspberry Pi, and yet until very recently. We've done very little charitable work um, in North America. Last weekend, we actually ran our first teacher training event in the Bay Area um, uh, with the Computer History Museum. And so I'm kind of hoping we're going to see a lot more of that in the U.S. Um, it's kind of replicating some of the programs we've had in the U.K. and customizing them for the U.S. So that's kind of the charitable side. Um, on the technical side, um, we, we sold about 3 million Raspberry Pis in, uh, in 2015. Uh, be good to get north of 4 million this year. That would be good. That'd be good, healthy growth. Um, I think I'd like to. Um, I'd, I'd like to see it. There are areas of the world where you can't buy it at the moment, and I would like to see. Um, uh, I, I, I'd like. I'd like to see it make some progress, particularly in South America. It seems very strange that you can't get your hands on a Raspberry Pi particularly easily in South America when there's enormous demand and uh, 
um, you know, um, there, there's a there's a there are a lot of technically literate people in, in, in South America asking for Raspberry Pis, but we're really struggling to get them in there at the moment. Well, you've been speaking with Evan Upton. He is the CEO of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. He is their, their visionary, their hardware architect. Thank you very much for joining us, and, and thank you for sharing all of this, and congratulations on your fourth anniversary. If people wanted to find out more about the Raspberry Pi Foundation, as you said, it is a charity, where could they go online to read about who you are, what your mission is, and, and more about how you're trying to bring affordable computing to the world. Uh, so we have a website at, uh, at raspberrypi.org, www.raspberrypi.org. Um, we, we have a blog, which we try to maintain. Uh, we, we, we try to post something new every day, um, either something we're doing uh, or these days more frequently something somebody else is doing with the Pi, whether it's a hobbyist uh, or, or whether it's an educational um, organization. Uh, we have a forum which we work very hard to, uh, to, to make approachable. So, you know, we would, if, if, you, if you know nothing about computing uh, and you'd like, to, you'd like to get involved, we would encourage you to come to the forum because we, you know, we work very hard. There is no such thing as a stupid question uh, on the Raspberry Pi forums. So uh, come and check it out. Mr. Upton, it has been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Again, thank you for your tech. And folks, if you're looking for the latest and greatest in geekness, you got to think about a pie.